Thanks, thanks Alicia. Um, yeah, in terms of thanks, I, I, um, I also like to pass on my thanks to, to in particular, to, um, to Raglan Drilling for, for, for continuing their, their fantastic sponsorship of, of, um, of just keeping the, keeping the Kalgoorlie geological community going like, or together like this. I think it's an absolutely fantastic thing. Um, and, particular, and also to Alicia, absolutely fantastic effort over, was it, I think it's three years, uh, Sarah, you were saying, three years this has taken to get together. Um, Alicia, it's amazing, amazing how, you, how you've managed to do it and, uh, and, and thank, you for, thank you for doing it, it's fantastic, it really is. Okay, now, following on from Scott's not, not going to be an easy thing to do, and, and um, Scott, for what it's worth, I can't remember, wouldn't have a bloody clue what the, what the formula for chlorite was, or is. <laughs> In fact, I can hardly remember what the, what, the, what the formula for quartz is at the moment, but um, <laughs> could be worse, I could be a structural geologist. <laughs> okay, all right, just a, just a bit of a plug for a couple of, uh, a couple of our products first. Um, these, these two products represent the sum total of our, of our big geochemical databases. Um, obviously, this one here is the, is, um, it's, it, it's the, the, the barcoding data. We also have going a, um, a, a regional granite geochemical um, database now that Scott's a, a, alluded to. Um, the benefit of these two data sets is that all of the data that we, we analyse, we analyse using a set, a, 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 quite a particular um, set of, uh, of processes and we do it at a single laboratory. So these are, are internally consistent high quality geochemical data sets and I know we, we can't seem to get the data out quick enough but, uh, but we are trying and there will be, um, will be new data, uh, data releases coming, um, coming along soon. Okay, so what is Geochemical barcoding. It, it's, it's essentially just uh, it's essentially just um, just chemo stratigraphy. So we use we use um, we, we apply high quality geochemistry to erect uh, a detailed chemo stratigraphy in areas where we can, and we use that as a template to try and inform us where we might be in a in a stratigraphy where we don't have as much ge ge geological context. Um, so we'll discuss how we've gone about erecting this chemostratigraphy in the gold fields, um, the processes, the concept, concepts, the applications, and, uh, and what, you, what we hope you might get out of, um, out of, the, out of the barcoding in terms of uh, um, its, its application to stratigraphy and, and also to, 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 general my, uh, to general mapping in the region. Um, and then we'll look at more regional aspects, what we can get out, um, perhaps in terms of regional geological evolution, tectonic evolution, and maybe even, um, maybe even mineral systems. So I'll try and fumble my way through that a bit later on. Uh, you'll know when that happens because I'll start waving my arms. Um, okay, so these sorts of things, beautifully, beautifully preserved magmatic textures. We've all seen them in core throughout the gold fields. Absolutely fantastic when we see them. You know, they, 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 they show us what what conditions these these magmas came out at? You know, the, 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 whether they're flows or or whether they're underwater. You know, a whole lot of whole lot of really really interesting things. And you know, it's textures like that, lot like this, that really make us um, make 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 what we do really interesting. But unfortunately, in the gold fields, these aren't all that common. And if you're logging chips, then okay, then it doesn't really matter whether they preserve textural you know, magmatic textures or not, because you're not really going to see them. Um, so, great, these, these are lovely, but the more depressing reality of, of, of logging, uh, logging basalts in the gold fields is, is more this, the, the, the really sort of uh, just generic medium, uh, sorry, fine grain, fine to medium grain sometimes, um, generic basalt. And, and, you know, you're faced, with, you're faced with a whole lot of decisions about where something like that may have come from in the, um, in the stratigraphy. So, for example, you, know, you might be out the back of Kalgoorlie somewhere and these sorts of rocks are coming up in, your, up in the drill core and, uh, and your manager says, well, you know, we're in the stratigraphy, are we? And without, any, without much more geological context, you're pretty well stuck. You know you're somewhere near Cambaud or Kalgoorlie, so you can narrow it down a bit. But, you're, but, you're, but you're, you know, the, um, the possibilities are still quite numerous. So, 
you know, what do you do? There's, you know, there's no point asking a structural geologist because they're typ typically off with a fairy somewhere between D2 and dementia. But they're <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's lucky. It's lucky for me because there's none here. But um, <laughs> all right. Um, so, so what do you do? I mean, it's a pretty pragmatic question. Uh, um, and you know, we're all we're all looking for a superhero here, and it just so happens that. Um, Unless totally altered, um, most mafic sequences in the Archean and, 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 and in, well, right throughout Earth history, they do tend to retain quite a specific geochemic, uh, uh, geochemical DNA. So, so what we're going to talk about today is how we, how we go about identifying this DNA and deciphering it and putting it to, together to try and construct a chemo stratigraphy. Um, now, most of your geochemists are already doing this. They all, they all work to, a, to some sort of a geochemical template. They, they, they take your analyses, they look at them, and they, um, they decide, well, you know, this might be, this looks like the lower basalt, so, so you're down here um, in the lower part of the stratigraphy. So, look, what we're really trying to add is, is, is much better definitions on the geochemical groupings. Um, we want to add to the number of geochemical, there, there are a whole lot of other geochemical types out there that aren't being captured. Um, that, that high quality geochemistry does capture. So we want to capture those and we want to extend it right throughout the, um, right throughout the eastern gold fields in, 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 eventually. But, um, but for the, you know, at the moment, we're, we're concentrating on the, on, on the, on the kalgoorlie Cambalda region. Um, and we also want to give an indication as, why, as, as to why these, why these variations occur. So you know, this, is the really, this is the really fun bit. You know, what do these variations mean? Start getting, start, start getting people thinking about what these variations mean in terms of Earth history. Um, now, this, this, is all, this is all work in progress, so if anyone here thinks that they can help us, then you almost certainly can, so, so um, don't be shy. Um, where are we working and where do we think we have enough data? That's a, that's a stupid question. Um, we never have enough geochemical data, but we do have we do have a, a, a royal ton of it near um, in, in, in the Cambala, Kalgoorlie, sort of Orobanda to Cambala region, and we are, we think we are fairly quite close to um, close to enough in those regions. We've published the first bar barcode for, for for that region, but um, we almost almost certainly need to tweak that a bit. Um, the Hampton Hill formation, for example, now that's that's proving to be a real beast. Uh, highway formation is also really difficult to to, to characterise. Um, although the talk today, I'm, I'm not going to talk much about the Black Flag Group, but we need to do a whole lot more work in the Black Flag Group. Why, you know, we've, for instance, why, why in that, that kalgoorlie Campbell, the corridor, uh, are, 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 is, is the Black Flag Group so ubiquitously, you know, almost entirely characterised by really well character, uh, by really well defined snookatoid like magmas, but as soon as you move into the, into the Coolgardie, uh, Kulgadi region, then um, you know, not so many, not so many snookatoid uh, like rocks, um, more sort of high calcium style volcanics. Um, same thing, same thing seems to be happening as we do, as we move down to Campbell, uh, down to down to the Norseman region. Um, you, you're really struggling to find snookatoid like rocks down there, but but high calcium, uh, high calcium volcanics and, and high field strength element rich volcanics are, are more the norm. So, you know, why, why, why is that happening? Um, from the Orobanda to Leinster region, um, probably not far away from being able to um, produce some sort of a, a barcode from the, from the rocks up there. Waluna, um, we've got a bit of data from up here, but um, we're still a way off from, from, from getting enough there. Um, Campbell, the Norseman, we're very, we're very close. We've actually been collecting a whole lot of data from down there. Uh, some really interesting things happening down there. Very different to what we expected. Very different to what, um, what, uh, to, to, to what, what the, uh, what I guess conventional thought on the stratigraphies and their correlations with uh, correlate with stratigraphy up here um, is. But um, yeah, so we will probably be having have something out from that region within a year. Uh, and we're also collecting a whole lot of data from um, from the eastern part of the Kalgoorlie uh, of the Canalpe terrain. Um, so that'll be really really interesting. Again, the rocks over there are, uh, they at first glance appear very very different. Okay, some preliminary observations based on what we've done so far. Um, everything we've we've looked at so far gives us good reason to believe that the whole barcoding concept really should work. 
Um, uh, it, it has been the, the the, the, the geochemistry has been a lot more complicated than we, than we first anticipated, uh, a lot more groups than we first an anticipated. But that's actually good because that gives us, uh, that gives us a, lot more, a lot greater chance of coming up with unique combinations of, 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 uh, of sort of stratigraphic specific groups. Um, now there's no typical, no typical greenstone stratigraphy, chemostratigraphy, and that that's, that's actually a bit, of, a bit of a surprise. You know, the whole concept, the whole thought of, of, a, of a unifying greenstone stratigraphy that could stretch all the way from Norseman all, you know, all the way up to, up to Waluna is an absolute pipe dream. Um, it, it's hard enough to correlate between Cambodia and Kalgoorlie, let alone uh, over, over, over that sort of a distance. The real surprise is that, the, um, in fact, the, the kalgoorlie Cambodia stratigraphy is, is, the, is really, out of the ones that we've looked at, is really the odd one out. So, you know, it's quite ironic that that it's the Kalgoorlie Cambodia stratigraphy that we use as a reference when we're, when we're you know, right throughout the eastern gold fields, we refer everything back, we compare it back to the Kalgoorlie stratigraphy, and that's, that's the odd one out. So, um, yeah, we've got to stop doing that. Um, to make the barcoding work, you do need reasonably good geochemical data. Um, but I, I really do believe that most of the data that you are getting from the, um, from the, from the companies nowadays is good enough. Take Scott's advice. Um, you really do need the, the good quality four acid digest uh, ICPMS data. If it's not IP, ICPMS, then, then, then don't even bother. Um, never rely solely on geochemistry alone, just like any other discipline in geology. You know, the answer is not just with one stream. Um, the, right answer, the right answer must satisfy all geological, all, all geological data, all geological disciplines. Um, just a note in here, yeah, yeah, that doesn't mean you should go and actually believe your structural geologists though. Um, rather than looking at, at just at the stratigraphy, I, I would urge people to start using the greenstone geochemical barcoding to actually start, start looking at stages in greenstone evolution rather than just, the, just, the, just greenstone compositions. Okay, so just some, some regional bucket geochemistry. Um, we want to wrestle this DNA out of our, out of our basalts. What do we look for in a, in, in a suite of elements? Um, now I'll start off by saying the elements that I'm looking for are slightly different to the ones that, uh, that Scott's been talking about because of our, our, our purpose is a bit different. Um, but, the, but the process is exactly the same. Um, now for us, what we, what we, what we, what we want are uh, Elements that are relatively insensitive to, to all but the most extreme alteration. Uh, elements that show concentrations that are relatively simple, they're predictable, and they're proportional to the igneous processes that we're trying to, um, trying to identify that, that, that are in fact causing the, causing the um, compositional variations in the first place. Um, so we, we like to choose elements that, uh, that also avoid entering into the main mineral phases that are crystallising uh, in the early stages of, of basalt, uh, basalt um, basalt cooling, um, or elements that are, that are very, very diagnostic of one specific, uh, one specific mineral. Uh, numerous examples uh, of that um, have just been, uh, Scott's just gone through. Um, so we're after the highly incompatible trace elements, and, and for mafic magmas, these include the, um, the high field strength element cations, Scott's been through this, the, they include niobium, tantalum, zirconium, hafnium, and titanium. Um, also extremely good thorium under most, under most of the conditions that you guys will, as long as the rocks are fresh, reasonably fresh, thorium won't move, starts to move at, um, at mid to upper amphibolite facies. Um, so, so as long as your, your rocks are or, or under extreme conditions of uh, extreme alteration. Um, so th thorium should be a really good element for most of what you want. Um, and the light rare earth elements. Um, just a note about using titanium. Um, we do, and we use it quite extensively, it's very good, but just be aware, um, all of the rocks, nearly all of the rocks that we're looking at are tholeite, so at some stage in their crystallisation path, they are going to stabilise an iron titanium oxide, uh, and so the behaviour of titanium is going to, is going to change from highly incompatible to, um, to less incompatible and, and, and eventually to compatible. So. Um, our concentrations over over about one and a half weight percent, um, then uh, start doubting. Um, start well, it just just uh, start worrying about what tit what titanium is actually doing. Um, 
but as I say, we do use titanium. Um, the, 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 the main diagrams that we've, we've used in, in barcoding, there, there are a whole heap of them, but, the, but we, the, the ones that we tend to get the most information out usually are, are plotting an a highly incompatible um, trace element against titanium, um, typically thorium, niobium, lanthanum, and zirconium, a whole just suite of, of plots that I guess was first... Um, this actually popularised by Steve Barnes. Um, now thorium's quite, thorium is quite sensitive and you can actually see the effect of titanium here. This is at about, what's that, 1.5 weight percent. Uh, all, all of a sudden a titanium, uh, an iron titanium oxide mineral is starting to crystallise and you get this inflection um, in, in this trend of low thorium basalts. So, so just, be aware, just be aware of that if, if you are using thorium that you, that you should start expecting some sort of, some sorts of in, in inflections after about one, one and a half to 1.7 weight percent. Um, now, because of that inflection, if I just, uh, I want to actually just, just go through how these diagrams work. So I'll avoid, for the purposes of, of that, I'll avoid using, um, using titanium. Uh, and instead, I'll, 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 cho I'll choose to use thorium uh, over zirconium. Um, and, and in this plot, as in all of the titanium the diagrams, the, the composition of, of, of crust, because it's important in demonstrating how these things work, the composition of, of, of Archean crust is, is up here in the top left-hand corner. Okay, so how these diagrams work in, in very, very simple terms. Um, because none of these elements uh, are, are concentrated to any degree whatsoever in, in any of the, um, the early forming minerals when we're crystallising a basalt, we can, we can essentially assume that their behaviour is totally incompatible. Okay, so that means that as this basalt crystallises, these trace elements in their entirety concentrate in the, uh, in the residual liquids. And they start increasing in the residual liquids and the rate of that increase is proportional to the ratio of those elements in the, in the homogenised source region, so the ratio of, of Y over X. Now, if nothing else happens to that magma as it crystallises, those those, those data should form a straight line uh, and that straight line should project back to the origin and the slope of that line is the ratio of Y over X in, the, um, in the, what in this case is the mantle source region. Um, and, and so if we look over here in the thorium zirconium diagram, these are our low, these are our low thorium basalts, so the most primitive basalts that we see, uh, see in, 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 in many Archean terrains. They plot on a, on, a, on a straight line, projects back to, to the field for Camardiite. So Camardiites and these primitive, these primitive low thorium basalts actually have very, very similar uh, mantle compositions, which is, which is quite interesting in itself. Um, but the vast majority, 80% of, of Archean basalts, would plot in that field there. It's where we expect somewhere between primitive, primitive mantle and, and, um, and, a, normally, uh, and a, nor, uh, a normal morb. So I guess for our purposes, we can, we can sort of consider this as, a, um, as, a, as an un, uncontaminated, undifferentiated primitive mantle reference line. So in our data sets, we'll always, we, we, we get a lot of trends that don't project back to the origin. Um, now we can rationalise those by projecting them back onto our mantle ref reference line. And the assumption here is that these is that a, a, a primitive mantle melt, leaving the mantle, it might fractionate for a short distance and then something happened to it. Now this this something is usually crustal contamination, and, and so it becomes contaminated. Um, it, the X Y ratio in in the homogenised source increases, and it heads off on its own new trajectory. And again, if it forms a straight line, then nothing else is happening to it. It's, 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 um, it's undergoing what, we, what we'd refer to as closed system fractionation. Alternatively, it may head off on that, that path for a short distance, and again, it gets it ponds somewhere, um, sucks in some more, some more crust, uh, homogenized, and, and it, heads off, it then heads off on, its, uh, on another on another trajectory, again defined by the XY ratio. And you can see the effect of, 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 of crustal contamination is always to increase, is always to increase this slope or, or to change this slope towards the composition of, of crust. Okay, so that's the effect of crustal contamination that does that. The effects of fractionation um, uh, head, heads off in that direction. Um, and if, uh, if, you have, if you have these quite attenuated 
um, fractionation, fractionation paths, these quite attenuated liquid lines of descent, then then it's not invariably the case, but you'd be pretty, um, pretty fair. You'd, be, you'd have a pretty good chance betting that these things were actually emanating from a, from a, um, from a, a layered seal in a, in a mid to upper crustal chamber, a place where they're having where it sort of becomes rather stagnant. And these things have the time and the and, and the ability to fractionate and, and, and separate the, the crystals from the liquids and, and produce quite quite um, quite fractionated um, quite fractionated magmas. Okay, so fractionation and crustal contamination. All right, another diagram that I, that, I, that I tend to like, tend to use a lot, um, plots the aluminium titanium ratio. Uh, here I've got them against aluminium and titanium. Um, you could plot them against cheese for all that matters because we're really just interested in the aluminium titanium ratio. And the reason why, and, and again, Scott pointed this out earlier on, is, is that, is that this, this actually this actually shows us what what plagioclase is doing, whether plagi whether plagioclase is crystallising, whether it's been stable or stabilised, or whether it's becoming unstable. So at high, when when the mantle melts at, um, at reasonably high pressures, um, plagioclase isn't stable, and, and so the magmas that mag the magmas that you produce, they should have an aluminium titanium ratio around 20. So if you come across a um, uh, a basalt, London basalt, for example, is a good uh, a good example. It's got an aluminium titanium ratio of around 20. So, that from from that you can infer that this magma has actually come from its mantle source. Now it's gone all the way. It's 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 migrated all the way to the surface and erupted as as the London basalt or a lower basalt or whatever. And nothing essentially has happened to that magma. So that's telling us something about the tectonic conditions. That's telling us something about the plumbing. Um, Conversely, if it's got a, a magnesium, uh, sorry, a, a, an aluminium titanium ratio lower than 20, then that's telling us that that magma is stalling somewhere. Uh, tip, typically, I mean, I'm, this is this is simplifying. This is simplifying things quite quite a lot. Um, it's basically telling us that the magma is it's, it's risen, and for some reason it's stalled. It's fractionated. It's stalled at a pressure below which. Uh, um, uh, plagioclase is stable, so it's crystallising plagioclase. Aluminium titanium ratio is going down, uh, and, and aluminium aluminium is increasing. So it follows a path like that. Um, you'll find you, you'll find compositions up here if it's actually accumulating plagioclase. Um, more typically, the path will be, the, the, the liquid line of uh, descent will, will drag it down this way. So the beauty of using these diagrams together. So these. Um, in, in combination with the with, with the plots using titanium, is that you can you, not only can you pull out discrete individual populations and, and from that actually build up your chemostratigraphy, you can actually start seeing how conditions uh, so uh, conditions at the at the base of the crust or conditions during partial melting, conditions during magma magma migration, conditions during eruption, how these sorts of conditions change stratigraphically as well. And you can start building up, building up a picture of the tectonic evolution. Um, and I, yeah, look, I, I guess this isn't just a thought exercise because these 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 changes are happening for a reason. You know, these these are these are uh, events or, or, or triggers or or requirements perhaps in a in a, in a particular mineral system. So it's a, so yeah, it's far from a thought exercise. It's it, it, it's really a, a, an exercise that um, that perhaps we should be doing. Okay, so when you go through the um, quite, quite an arduous task of identifying these, um, the, these specific basalt populations, and, and, and by the way, you know, we, we, use a whole lot of, we use a whole lot of diagrams in, in doing this, and the process is exactly the same as the one that, uh, that Scott just articulated. Um, it, it's, it's simply a matter of, of, of erecting a whole lot of plots that have a, a real geological meaning, um, looking for groups and testing whether they're valid. And you test whether they're valid. Um, what, what, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of tests. Um, plot it, you always plot them up geographically to make sure they make sense geographically. Um, but we've always got to make sure that, we always make sure that these, group, these groupings, that they, that they don't contravene any, any sort of laws of igneous, igneous geochemistry, if you like. Plot the groups up against, um, in, in terms of their, their, their major elements. They really must form 
trends that are logical in terms of, in terms of magmatic evolution. Um, so after you've gone through that task, we're actually surprised at the, um, the amount of diversity we had. The number of clearly discernible geochemical groups was, 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 quite, um, was quite a surprise. I think we came up with 26 in all, um, and 15 alone in the, uh, in the low thorium basalt um, category. So that's, um, that, that was quite amazing to me. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's actually quite good because, uh, again, it sort of increases the chances of us being able to identify a, u a unique combination um, of stratigraphically defined, um, defined units. But, but what it does do is it, it, it plays havoc with our, with our nomenclature because a lot of these groups aren't just restricted to one stratigraphic horizon, right? So, so uh, a number of them occur, occur, occur throughout the stratigraphy, so we can't apply stratigraphic terms to them. So what, what we've chosen to do is, is look at the two, the two parameters that are, causing the, the, that are responsible for the most amount of compositional change in the, uh, in the basalts, and that's contamination and its fractionation. Um, and, and so the, the low thorium, intermediate thorium and high thorium basalt classification itself already is telling us something about contamination. Um, so, so that forms the first letter of our, uh, uh, of our nomenclature, L for low, um, I for intermediate, high, uh, H for high, and we introduce a secondary measure of contamination. So within the low thorium uh, basalt classification, we identify U for uncontaminated, C for contaminated, S for strongly contaminated, and, and so forth. So, so a basalt that's um, that's down here, for example, that's a low, that's a low thorium basalt, L for low. It's uncontaminated, so L U, and it's not fractionated, so L U one. Um, a basalt up here, for example, it's an intermediate thorium basalt, so it's I. It's um, it's very strongly fractionated, for example, so uh, that, that's going to be I V. Um, and it's quite fractionated if it's up here, so that'll be IV4 and, and so forth. And we reference everything, we reference everything back to, to, to one single diagram for, 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 for ease, uh, and we choose the thorium-titanium diagram. Okay, so this is the barcode. This is, the, this is our, our first iteration of the barcode for the kalgoorlie cambalda region. Um, I guess... Some of the things we, we can we can see straight away is that is that we have a lower stratigraphy that's almost almost totally comprised of low thorium basalts, intermediate thorium basalts in the middle of stratigraphy, and and a range of high thorium basalts uh, along with a whole lot of other things in the in the upper stratigraphy. So so there does seem to be a systematic change in in the degree to where, to, where, to, uh, to which magmas are becoming contaminated as we go up stratigraphy. Um, and when we read this, uh, this stratigraphic chart, if, if we do recognise a stratigraphic difference between, for example, in the Lindsay's basalt, if we do feel confident that these LC magmas up here typically overlie the LU magmas, then we're displaying that on the chart. If we're not sure, then we're putting them side by side, and the proportion of these, box, these boxes is relative to the number of samples that we managed to collect from those particular groups. Um, where we've got numbers, where we've got numbers, um, we've done that in, in, in instances where we're unsure whether we whether, whether we really do have a, um, a statistically valid population. Um, for example, here in the uh, in, in the highway formation, uh, in this part, we've only had we only have three analyses of this of this particular type of LS magma, uh, and only one of this. So there's a huge degree of uncertainty here. So we, we're upfront about that. We put the number of analyses that, upon which that, that um, sort of classification is based there. Um, okay, so things that we can see straight away um, with the barcode, we, um, we, we can note straight away that instances where, where a particular stratigraphic unit compri comprises a single geochemical unit or, or, a, or a single unique geochemical unit, they're very, very rare. Bentry basalts, one example. Um, so if you come across anything like that, and you just happen to be in the Orobanda, Orobanda region, then then it's a it's a it's a pretty much a foregone conclusion. Um, 
Uh, similarly, the, uh, the Devon's console, basalt, as long as you know, you, as long as you can tell whether you're in the Cambalda domain or, or the Parker domain, if you get that sort of a composition, uh, it's, a, it's, a, was it, it's an, I, an IS2 composition, um, then that's, that's absolutely diagnostic of the Devon's console basalt. Um, several units are geochemically very, very complicated. Um, several units possibly could be subdivided stratigraphically, but I can't see any point doing that. Um, but most of the units do have a unique combination of, uh, of, of geochemically distinct um, com components. Um, for example, Lindsay's and Lunnan, um, they comprise at least, oh, sorry, the Lindsay's it comprises at least three different types uh, and, that, and that combination uh, of those three is absolutely diagnostic of the, uh, of the Lindsay's basalt. Um, there's also a significant regional asymmetry in the broad stratigraphy, so I've ordered these here from west to east, uh, and we can actually see that, um, that, that the, uh, the stratigraphic columns in their entirety seem to change uh, from west to east, and we'll talk a bit about that a, 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 a bit later. Um, and I think I've more or less covered that. Okay, so we've also produced a, a number of these, these templates um, and, 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 and we've utilised the diagrams that we've found most useful uh, for, identifying, for, for, for identifying the different geochemical groups. In this case, I've chosen the Cambelder domain. Uh, Cambelder domain is, is geochemically by far the simplest. Um, the, as long as you're not, not up here in the top, um, Peringa, Devon's console and Lunnan uh, are so easy to identify geochemically, very, very easy to identify from each other. Um, so it really is just a matter of, of, of looking at your geochemistry, looking where they plot on, on, on these diagrams uh, and hopefully you should be able to pinpoint yourself relatively easy, uh, easily. Um, just a word of warning, um, even in the Cambalda domain, and particularly if you're at, the, at, the, at the top, um, one or two analyses is not going to do you much good at all. Geochemistry doesn't work on points; it works on it works on clusters and it works on trends. So, if you've only got a couple of analyses, then um, then, then you're probably expecting way too much. Um, you know, this approach needs needs a fair bit of data. The best the best way of, of identifying where you are is with is when you have data that crosses crosses from one stratigraphic level to another. Uh, okay, so this is the Orobanda domain. It's much more complicated geochemically, a lot more geochemical groups. Um, just toggle backwards and forwards, a lot more geochemical groups in the, in the Orobanda domain. But the same principle, um, same principle arises if you know you're in the Orobanda domain and you get, you get an IS, uh, I think this is, a, this is an IS4 uh, composition. It's, it's got to be the Bentry basalt. If you get an IS2 co uh, composition, you're in the Big Dick basalt. Um, and um, you know, that, that seems to work quite well. Um, even more complicated is, is the Coolgardy domain. So again, let's toggle between, toggle between the two. Um, the the Coolgardy domain is, is, is a bit of a dog's breakfast, but, uh, but you know, that, that's, that's good. It, it, it actually it, it, in a sense, makes it easier to, 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 um, to, to identify where you are. A lot of the complexity here is related to two specific horizons. It's, um, that's this, this area up here in the Hampton Hill Formation um, and this lower part um, down here. So let's, we'll have a, a bit of a closer look at those. Um, so the Hampton Hill Formation was a, was a big surprise to, to, to us. Um, I guess the survey had never done any, um, had never done much really detailed work in that region. We didn't have a, too much geochemistry from there, so we, we didn't really know what, what to expect. So being able to identify within that region quite a discrete unit of, of, of intermediate thorium basalts was a, was a bit of a surprise. To be able to, 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 to map it out um, around the Dunsville granite diorite was also a surprise, and it's, a, it's just a good example of how of how this approach really can be used to, in, a, in the context of, of regional, even, even local detailed mapping. Um, there's no reason why this doesn't work down to the camp scale, the prospect scale, or even the mine scale. So it really can and, and, and certainly is uh, helping us to improve the, um, improve the geological maps. Um, 
having a look at the lower stratigraphy, um, for quite some time there's been a bit of a controversy as to whether the greenstone sequence in the in the Coolgardie region is a, there, there seems to be two um, two two sequences, either a stratigraphic repetition or or, uh, or one over the other, uh, two two different sequences. Um, now the geochemistry is quite emphatic about that. The the lower sequence is geochemically absolutely distinct. There are two there are two green, separate greenstone sequences in the Kalgoorlie in the Coolgardie cool domain. Um, they may or may not be separated by a thrust. I don't know, but they're two separate separate um, separate greenstone sequences. Um, now the lower sequence has a very very distinctive composition, uh, and we can find. Um, units elsewhere that have the same geochemical range. Um, up here in the Orobanda domain you get a few of these sorts of compositions um, but uh, and also around, around this, this is in fact where, where, the, where they were picked up first but around the Scotia Dome we get quite a, quite a continuous string of, of these compositions that are very very diagnostic of the lower stratigraphy and they and in this in this area they actually underlie basalts that we would other, otherwise place at the lower stratigraphic level of the Kalgoorlie sequence. Um, so they're in the right place. I, I don't know whether that whether what what the people working in the area think of that idea, but that, that's certainly something that can be tested. Um, now the other area where we are finding a lot of these a lot of these types of basalts is now down in the Norseman area, which which is uh, which is, again was a real surprise to us. Um, We've known we've we've had these 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 hints of a, of a 2.9 age um, date from the um, from the Penny Shore formation for for, for decades, um, variously attributed to a number of different rock types. Um, now Jung Jung and and, and Jaitarin, Jaitarin have gone down there and they've they've been able to verify these dates and and and, and pick them up in other uh, in other outcrops. Um, we've also got some other quite interesting um, old ages from down there, but. But what's a real surprise is that the is that the Mount Kirk formation uh, in this region down here, which is previously placed as a correlative of, uh, uh, say, the Devon's console level in the Kalgoorlie area, um, comprises almost in its, in its entirety the, these these older um, these older compositions that are characteristic of the Lower Coolgardie region, um, and we've also just managed to get get an age on on, on Kamatiadi on felsic interbeds in Kamatiites down there, 2713, which, you know, it's within error of the, of the typical 2706 uh, Kamatiite, but, um, but only just, um, and, and it's, just, yeah, it's just, just very, very interesting. Um, so to watch this space, this is, um, this is what we're doing at the moment. We just need a few more dates before we're confident about, about publishing much on this. Okay, if we look at some, some real exploration data, so this set was handed to me blind. Um, this is uh, just a heat map uh, that, that I've constructed over over these data, and um, these are our these are our um, our barcoding data. Um, I must admit it's 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 straight away absolutely distinctive where we are. We're sitting in Cambalda here. It, it's it, it can't be anywhere else. Um, that's that's the, that's the that's the London the London basalt there. That's the Devon's console there. Um, the Pringa basalt up through there, and that's the Athena. That's the real Athena, Scott. And um, and this is the LS4, um, the, the LS4 that, that Louis was talking about uh, a couple of Raglan talks ago that underlies the uh, that sits between the um, the the, uh, the black flag and the um, and the Peringa. Um, as I said, in terms of its thorium titanium ratio, it's a dead ringer for the uh, for the Athena, but in in, in other respects, it, it it's quite distinctive. Um, so you know, none of these. So we know we're not up up near near Kalgoorlie. If we're somewhere in between, we'd be we'd, we'd be getting both that and that. Down in Cambalda, it's the it's the Athena. Um, this is distinctive just as much for what it doesn't have as for what it, as for what it does have. We don't have any of these LC magmas that characterise the lower part of the. Um, the, the sequence in Coolgardie, so we know we're on the western, uh, on the on the eastern side, sorry, of the of the Zaluka. Um, so this is quite the, uh, diagnostic, and, and I'd maintain that we could do the same for just about any exploration data set that was given to us, as long as as long as it's within a region that we've done the barcoding on, we'll be able to to tell you more or less where we are. Um, 
yeah, but that's that's not the point of the barcoding um, the barcoding project. It's not um, you know it's not an e perb for, for structural geologists that can't find themselves. It's um, it, 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 but it does show it does show um, you feel persecuted, don't you, over there? It, it does show it does show you the fidelity of of what we're trying to do, what we, what, of what the what the process is capable of doing. Um, I also just want to mention, uh, uh, just briefly mention the the um, the noise that we tend to get in between in between populations like this. So um, I, I know a lot of the, the tendency with a lot of with a lot of companies is to is to is to classify these these sorts of data sets into you, you have your your lower thorium basalt, so your low thorium basalts, your intermediate thorium basalts, and your high thorium basalts, and and all of this. This stuff in between is just snot. It's just noise, and 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 you, and you tend to ignore it. Um, I'd really urge you not to do that. At least have a look at it, because you really need to be able to tell the difference between real noise and really important data. This is where a lot of the a lot of the smaller units sit. They sit in this snot, uh, and if you if you don't identify it, then you're going to miss it. You're going to miss out on a whole lot of data. Do your heat maps. Make sure you do your heat maps. None of them exist in this population. But, but do your heat maps, you never know, you might pick them up. Um, the, other, the other thing is, just as important as these ratios are the concentrations of these groups. Don't forget the concentrations. Um, a lot of the groups are very, very specific in, 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 in their range of incompatible trace elements. So, if all you're doing is identifying low thorium basalts, then anything on, on that line there would be classified as a low thorium basalt. And the tendency, the tendency would be low thorium basalt equates to lower stratigraphy. So anything, any, 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 any bit of data I find in that, I'm going to assign to the lower stratigraphy. Uh, and you know, you appreciate that the, the victorious basalt sits there. A whole lot of the basalts in the upper part of the sequence are erupting from erupting from layered sills that themselves are derived from low thorium basalts. So they're going to have low thorium titanium thorium ratios or low thorium, oh sorry, low, low, um, low thorium zirconium titanium ratios. And if you can't, if you don't use the actual concentrations along with the, with, with the ratios, then you run the risk of, 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 of making some, some quite fatal errors. Okay, I mentioned a few slides ago that um, that there does tend to be uh, that that the stratigraphy seems to seems to form into into some into, into some sort of geographically constrained groups. So we've got the eastern domains over here, the western domains over here, and in between the Orobanda, we have the Oro, uh, the, the stratigraphy in the Orobanda region. And that seems to behave a lot more like the, the, the lower stratigraphy in its lower regions and more like the upper stratigraphy in the upper regions. And, and so we can, you know, the, the, that, that's more or less the, 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 the Zalika shear um, would define that boundary there. Uh, and this, this boundary here would be defined by the, uh, the combination of the Bardock and the, and the, abattoir, the abattoir fault. So I think these faults, these faults are, are extremely important. They account for more diversity in the stratigraphy than any other faults in the region. Um, they almost certainly reflect uh, in some way the, the structural, uh, structural architecture. Um, but we've got to be a bit careful here because the, the group of processes forming that or, or distinguishing these rocks from the group of processes Distinguishing these rocks are, are processes that are happening in the lower crust at the, at the lower crust mantle boundary, and and so to make the assumption that whatever's separating those groups of uh, of, of of basalts in the lower crust that, that that can be extrapolated up to the surface of the earth and and it and, and it um, and it precisely aligns with the Zalika or the Bardock fault is um is just a, a, con a convenient interpretation that's almost certainly wrong in detail, or, although I don't think it's it's going to be wrong. Um, I don't think it's going to be too far off. It's, it's, not, it's not coincidental, I'm sure, that, um, that the same boundaries basically separate um, geochemically distinct, distinct groups of, uh, of black flag group. So in this region up here, 
uh, black flower group shows much better, much work, much much better defined snookatoid like compositions uh, over in this region out here. Uh, not so much, and and also uh, it's probably not probably not coincidental that that we have a very very different. We have we we, we have much better developed upper stratigraphies in terms of the high thorium basalts and the uh, and the intermediate thorium basalts. So, so there are some real differences, some real. Uh, geographically constrained differences in the stratigraphy in the stratigraphy, stratigraphy from um, from east to west. And the re the real point the real point about this slide um, is is that you know I, I really do think it's about time that we 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 either abandoned or, or, or totally reevaluated the. Um, the, the domain concept, or at least at least in its um, in its present form, um, because the the chemostratigraphy just doesn't doesn't seem to doesn't seem to um, to to pay any attention to it. Um, so at least from the from the from the geochemical viewpoint, I, I can't see much point in. Um, it's a, certainly in, in, in the in the in its present form, it, it does need to be considerably um, revised. Um, now, I want to take this a bit further, and this is this is this is where the, the arm waving starts a bit. Um, from the regional perspective, this 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 barcoding data it it highlights what we've known for a long time, for decades. People have been talking about the the, the three tier stratigraphy in the in the gold fields, with a lower basaltic sequence, uh, an intermediate um, commartite commartitic basalt sequence, and an upper an upper basalt sequence. Um, so I just want to have a look at at what these changes might mean in terms of the tectonic evolution um, th throughout the region. Um, and I think for the most part, the lower two, the, 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 the middle and the lower sequence, they're, they're, quite, they're quite easy to understand. And, and, and we, can, we can do this by plotting the data up on, on, on our two faithful diagrams up here. So um, just to rehash, fractionation will take us in this direction. Contamination will take us in this, in this direction if we have um, aluminium titanium ratios around around 20. Then that's a that's a magma that's that's come all the way from the from the mantle um, to to its resting spot without changing much. Um, and anything sitting down here, these are lazy magmas. They've they've stopped on their way through and and, and had lunch or whatever and, and crystallised a bit of bit of plagioclase. Okay, so when we throw onto that our our lower sequence. This is all the beer. All the beer starting to take effect. <laughs> all right. When we throw on throw on the lower sequence, um, this is this is what we find. So these are our these are our our low thorium basalts. So LU1, LU2, uh, and they 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 make up the, the 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 sum total of all of the lower stratigraphy in the western. On the eastern um, eastern um, stratigraphies, and a vast majority, of, and, and and a large proportion of it over on the western domains, and these things. So here they are. Here, this is LU1, LU2. Notice a very very restricted range in in, in, in titanium, and even 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 more restricted in, in thorium. Um, so they're relatively unfractionated. They have um, they have they have uh, aluminium titanium ratios that are mantle-like or only slightly less. So these are. These are these are a case of, of magmas that have that have been generated in the mantle, uh, maybe ponded in the lower crust, and come screaming up these these, these major crust or faults, uh, these major faults, and and uh, and erupted as as huge fissure eruptions or, or shield volcanoes or whatever. They've come up more or less. They've come up. They've come up rapidly enough that they've had no opportunity to change opportunity to change in composition. Um, so so they they they're really rift like volcanics. Um, and, and I probably, uh, I, I guess, there's not too many people that would would differ in, in, in suggesting that that that's the that's exactly the environment that we'd envisage for these. Um, okay, so that's that's these magmas and these over here in the in the western stratigraphy. Well, what about these ones? These are the lazy ones, right? These um, these you can see them here. They're, they've they've a huge fractionation, liquid line of descent. Um, and, and, and in terms of the aluminium titanium ratio, it extends the full way from crust from, from mantle values all the way down to the to the lowest lowest 
ratios that we come across. So these, are, these have been fractionating plagioclase uh, right throughout their history, right? So they've, 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 as I say here, they've stopped for coffee, they've, they've had a cafe latte here, a, a, a cappuccino here, you know, what a life most will be a structural geologist, eh? But, um, <laughs> sorry, 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 mate. <laughs> Um, I think that's the last of my structural geology jokes, actually. Um, okay, so look, they've had a they've they've had a bit of a slower a slower ascent, a bit more a bit bit more of a, 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 a trial coming up. So, okay, that might mean thicker crust, maybe less extension, but but there's something different. There's something different between between here and here. Um, we drop on the middle sequence. Okay, so to get to the middle sequence, we've got to go through the, um, the, the, the Campbell de Camardiite. 2706 on the dot, it was 11, 11 o'clock in the morning, 10th of, 10th of April, it was over by lunchtime, covered the whole region, has to be a plume, um, no other way. Um, it, it's certainly a big event. Um, these, are, these, are, these represent huge degree partial melting, melting of, of the mantle. Um, typically attributed to a plume, but you know, these plumes are just the most amazing things, uh, whatever you want them to do, you know, if you burn your toast or, or, or you burn your sausage or your cat gets pregnant, it's, it's, a, it's a bloody plume, it has to be a plume, there's nothing else that can do these sorts of things, it's, um, they're like the, um, you know, the saying that the, the butler did, it must have been the butler, these are, these are the butlers of the, um, of, of the geological world and, and, and you know, in my opinion, they're they're responsible for, the, for, for more lazy science than just about anything else. You know, they, they almost clearly existed. They, they, they exist now. They probably did exist down, back in the Archean. But please, before you, before you invoke a mantle plume, just, just, just think a bit laterally and, and, and see where there's, a, where there's a possibility there might be another, or another explanation. Maybe there's not. But in any case, that's my rant over for the night. Um, the one thing that really does happen when we go from the lower stratigraphy to the upper stratigraphy to the middle stratigraphy is there's this profound increase in the degree to which the magmas become contaminated. So lower stratigraphy, they're all down here, low thorium basalts uh, and, and, and some, some, some slightly contaminated low thorium basalts up here. In this, at this level here, sorry, I, I should have also mentioned the commodiot, in, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the barcoding, the commodiots don't really help us all that much. They're great as a time marker, but their geochemistry, at least for the, mo for the most part, doesn't really lend itself to this process. Great as a time marker, but, um, but we can leave them there. We do sample them. We've got a huge database of, of these things. Um, someone else will, will no doubt find something very, very interesting in that, but, but not, for the, not for the barcoding. Um, okay, so there is this jump to, to much more contaminated magmas. But again, the same sort of thing happens between the, east, between the eastern, eastern stratigraphies and the western stratigraphies. So if we look at the, the Devon's console, Devon's console sits here, it's the red, the red box. It's, it's perhaps a bit fractionated, but not too much. Again, mantle, mantle um, aluminium titanium ratios. So not much has happened to it. It's, it's, it's also ponded maybe at the base of the crust. It hasn't changed much. And then it's come screaming up the full, um, the full crustal column and erupted on the surface, uh, more or less unimpeded. You could say the same for LS, LS1 over here. Um, these magmas are a bit different. They've, they've, they, they have, um, again, they're, they're, they're unfractionated. They've got, they've got, they've got mantle mantle aluminium uh, titanium ratios, but they've also got elevated ratios at low aluminium concentrations, not high aluminium concentrations where you'd expect um, them to be if they were a result of, of, of plagioclase accumulation. So what this is actually, this is, this is, a, this is actually a, a, a sort of the sort of a signature that you'd expect to get from, a, from melting of a refractory, um, a slightly refractory Hartzbergitic lithospheric mantle. Um, and and uh, I guess that's not really important here. All it's telling us is that the it, it, it is that, in fact, the mantle source regions down here might also be slightly different to the mantle source regions feeding the um, feeding the terrains to the uh, the columns to the um, to, to the east. But in any case, it, it seems to go from from source to um, 
source to resting site without undergoing too much change. But then we get these LS3 magmas, uh, these intermediate thorium magmas that we've identified in the Hampton Hill formation. Um, and they do tend to be, they're, 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 they're quite fractionated uh, and they've got low aluminium thor thorium ratios, aluminium titanium ratios. So again, they're, they're, they're quite lazy, lazy magmas and, and pointing to the same sorts of things maybe that there's, a, there's either, either less extension in this region or, or, it's, or it's a thicker crust. Okay, now we come to the, um, wrong way, to the upper sequence and this is where the fun starts and, and it's where the vigorous arm waving starts as well. Um, this is where things get, get really interesting. It's, it, this is also where it, it's, it, where I, I guess it's the, probably, probably the most important part of the stratigraphy, at least in terms of gold mineralisation, and, and, and particularly if, if, um, if like me and, 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 and Scott, and, and I'm sure many others, that you, that you think that, um, that gold mineralisation within the region almost certainly has some direct genetic link with specialised hydrated magmas, um, then this period is really, really important because this is the backdrop um, to, to, to all of that. Um, and, and what's outstanding about this stratigraphic level is, is, is first of all, the high thorium basalts. These are quite amazing. These are quite amazing rocks themselves. They're, um, they're also very, very high degree partial melts uh, of a mantle pyritite. In fact, their, their parental compositions as it left the mantle um, possibly didn't didn't differ from that of a camartite. The only di the main difference is that they're horrendously horrendously contaminated, and that's a result of um, as is the crustal contamination down down in this down in this region here. That's a contam that's that's a that's a result of, of probably of the the event that caused the camartite in, in, in the first place, and the, and the general thermal uh, thermal sort of uh, preparation that, that it's caused, the thermal weakening of the crust, making it more amenable um, to, to becoming um, a contaminant in, in the magmas. So these things are highly contaminated, ultramafic, ultramafic rocks. Um, and they're very abundant in the, eastern, in the eastern domains, not so much over in the west. Um, not sure whether that just reflects the fact that they, they've, been, they've been erased, they've been eroded away, or or whether they, they were ever actually developed there in the first place. Um, this is the part of the stratigraphy over which most of the, most of the sills are emplaced, most of the, the, the layered tholidic sills. Um, now these are, as I mentioned earlier, these, the parental magmas for most of these are, are these primitive uncontaminated LU2 magmas. Um, but for some reason, these are stalling in the upper crust uh, and and, um, and these these stagnant chambers are providing the ideal opportunity for these things to fractionate to quite quite extensive quite extreme compositions. Um, and the third outstanding uh, feature of this stratigraphic level, I guess, is the combination of the first two, and that's this this absolutely dynamic magmatic diversity. Um, uh, we, we we have the, the the high thorium basalts themselves. The, the fractionated tholeites that fed the, 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 the tholeites that fed the sills, the fractionated tholeites that resulted from that, um, these these all the, these all erupt. In fact, all of these green units up here, um, all of these units, basically have the compositions that we would expect to see from from um, from basalts directly erupting from from uh, from mid to upper crustal layered chambers. Um, so we have all of those. There's, there's good indications that the Sanukatoids are starting to, 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 to rear their heads in this part of the stratigraphy before, before the crescendo up here with the black flag group. Um, and, and so we have all of these, all of these, this, this diverse suite, suite, this diverse suite of, of, of magmas coexisting and, and it just provides this ideal opportunity for, 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 for a, a huge range of, of, of hybrid magmas. Uh, as well, and I think that's that's in fact what's happening. I, I think um, I think the Athena basalt and the um, and the um, the highly fractionated unit underlying the um, the gold the um, the black flag group in the Kalgoorlie region, I, I think are actually hybrid hybrid magmas. Um, now, a real problem with this part of the stratigraphy is is actually trying to rationalise how 
how all of these different magma types and, 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 their, and their source regions actually coexisted. Um, we, we strongly suspect that the, um, that the source for the Sanukatoids and, and, and the Black Flag group in general was a, um, was a, a fundamentally hydrated, uh, metasomatized mantle source. And the first, the first glimpse of these sorts of rocks, uh, of Sanukatoid type rocks, occurs all the way back at 2705. Um, and that's right at the time that the, um, the Kamadiite was, was, was happening. Um, and we get, we get Sanukatoid-like rocks peeping their head throughout this, this region. We've, the, through this, 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 uh, this part of the stratigraphy, we've recently just dated um, some felsic units interbedded with the uh, Peringa basalts and got, um, I think it was 2693. We have several, several ages on black flag rock um, black flag rock uh, black flag group um, uh, r rocks that, that that come back at uh, at sort of high 2690s close to 26 uh, close to 2700 albeit with 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 large errors but there's this hint that the um, the Sanukatoids were were starting to rear their heads here and, and again that's at a period when we're getting these um these these High thorium basalts, which uh, which are, which are which are which are Kamadiite, Kamadiite like again. So the problem with all of this, and the problem that 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 causes for the whole Sanukatoid model is is how the hell do you preserve a hydrated the hydrated mantle source for Sanukatoids in in an environment that's just been hammered by these high degree partial melting events. How does that survive? These are the sorts of sources that you increase the mantle temperatures any, any significant degree, flux melting occurs straight away and these things just disappear. They, they, they simply shouldn't be there. Um, and that, that got us thinking, well, you know, what if, what if the events that are causing these high degree partial melting events, rather than actually taking the water out of the, um, out of the, out of the, out of the mantle, we're actually, we're actually adding the water into the mantle. Um, and, and what got us thinking about, thinking that, that way were, were two, two recent publications. The first is this publication um, by, uh, by Mike Hartnady at Curtin University. Um, and and this, is, this is the result of, of, uh, of phase equilibrium modeling of, of, of Kamatiites and basaltic rocks from the, Kambe from, from the Yulgan. And so this is one of the conclusions that, that high magnesium, high, no, basically it, it, it's basically saying that high magnesium rocks and, 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 and ultramafic rocks can, once they're, once they're hydrothermally altered, they can absorb much more water than we originally thought they can, that they could, and they can carry that water as chloride, as, as chloride they can carry that water to much higher temperatures than we ever we ever thought possible and, and so they don't yield this water and, and, until until temperatures exceed 70 uh, 700 to 800 degrees um, and, and they go on to show that in in bits and pieces of archaean crust that um, that are anything but really really thick um, that any sort of any sort of hydrothermally altered chromatic bearing stratigraphy has to be has to be buried to mantle depths before it'll dehydrate. Um, now the second, the second paper was this one, and this this was this was uh, I gave this paper to um, to to Alicia a couple of couple of weeks ago, and and her husband said said he hadn't seen didn't see her for about two days afterwards. It's, um, it's this is this is actually quite a remarkable um, quite a remarkable. Uh, it's a study of, of variolitic basalts in, um, in, in, in Archean rocks from the Pilbara Craton. And so what these guys, what these guys actually found was, or, or determined was that, was that, it was essentially that in, in, their, in their view, the, the variolitic textures that we see in, in a lot of high magnesium rocks, and we all see them throughout the, throughout the Archean sequences, that these were the result of a, a, of, a, of a water enriched uh, a water enriched mantle um, and, and so the varioles themselves were, were more or less of a, an ex solution a late stage ex solution feature resulting in a uh, from a um, from a from a, a, a wet basaltic melt 
Um, and so, and they and they actually attribute this to to um, to lower crustal delamination uh, and uh, and and water coming off that. So, so I guess my take of those two is that buried hydrate, hydrated mafic and ultramafic crust, when exposed to mantle temperatures, gives off more water than we thought, uh, um, and perhaps this is in fact what what we're seeing in the um, in the presence of varioles. And so we actually visit the Joe Lord core library, as we all should. Um, you can see these sorts of things. And this is in the, these are in the Paringa basalts. These are beautifully developed varioles. Paringa basalt is, is, is locally absolutely crowded with varioles. Um, Devon console basalt, fantastic. I mean, they, these are just outstanding bloody, uh, uh, magmatic, magmatic structures. Um, absolutely crowded with very old. So, so I guess that gives us two things to ponder. Um, the, the first is that um, if if the high thorium, if the high thorium basalts are themselves related to a commodiotic parental magma, um, then then clearly something's happening. This, it's, this, this, this sets the scene. To, the scenario is a lot different to, to what, we, what, we've, what we've been led to believe with this, this one single plume resulting in a Kamatiite, like the blanket of the whole region at 2706. Um, clearly, we've got another event. It happens less than 10 million years after the Cambao, the Kamatiite. Um, our evidence from, from Norseman is there, there's possibly another event at 20, 2714. So there is a number of these, the, these events. And it, it's, it's just, it's simply not the, 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 the really simple scenario um, that, that I guess uh, uh, some of us have, have, uh, have otherwise thought. But more importantly, each time one of these catastrophic events occurs, it seems that the, uh, that the, the immediately preceding uh, immediately following basaltic units, if if uh, if the very old idea is anything to go on, uh, are, um, are are quite quite enriched in water, and that's um, I guess it's it, it's something that I, I really I really like, obviously, because what it does it provides the ideal opportunity uh, for us to develop a um, uh, the the ideal the ideal source, the ideal hydrated mantle source for the sinucatoids. Um, it happens in the right place at the right time. Um, and it also answers a question that Scott, Scott Haley's posed at a number of, a number of talks in the past. Um, and, that's, and that's why, um, uh, from, from, simply from his observation, why in areas where we do get large gold deposits, um, why we also tend to get well-developed sequences uh, of high thorium basalts. Uh, and by the way, the same's uh, the same's true of the, um, of the in the hem, in the up in the Pilbara with the Hemi deposit. Immediately before that, we have um, we have um, very very lytic um, high thorium basalts in the Loudons and Negri volcanics. So why do we why do we get these, and why do we why do we get a, a fully developed um, middle and um, and upper stratigraphy? And I think the answer there might be um, it's quite clear that. The high thorium basalts and the um, and the snookatoids can't be directly related genetically, but certainly the presence of these things might be might be telling us um, telling us something very interesting about the mantle, and that's that it's been through an event that's allowed it to be uh, that that's that's um, that's it's allowed the ingress of of water, so it's it's set up the scene where we quite possibly might have the type of uh, metasomatized uh, lithospheric mantle that might later lead to um, to, to sinucleotide style magmatism. So, although that 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 was a bit further afield than 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 the barcoding itself, I guess I guess it just shows you what we can do with the barcoding data. Um, it, it's not simply there. It's 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 not not only that we can we can use it for quite quite detailed stratigraphic correlations. There's a lot of really high quality data there that, that we can use in some very, very interesting ways um, to, to, to gain a lot more knowledge about, about how, how these Archean sequences evolved. Uh, and and it's, again, it's not just a thought exercise. If we can, if we can work through this geochemistry and, and other lines of evidence and start mapping 
mapping out events rather than just stratigraphic, stratigraphic horizons, mapping out events that, that, that might be meaningful in, in terms of um, mineral systems. And then, um, yeah, like I'm not sure uh, I'm preaching to people who are doing much, much the same already, but um, yeah, all right. Um, so look, in terms of, in terms of the barcoding, I, I think simply adding the fidelity to, to, to the existing way that people are, are using the geochemistry, um, simply adding that fidelity to, to, to the way we use it for, for stratigraphic, um, identifying stratigraphic levels, um, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a huge step there. Um, in terms of providing a much more regional data, data, database, I, I think, we're, I think, I think that's, that's, that's clearly what we are doing. That's a huge step forward. Um, in terms of highlighting how complicated the, the chemostratigraphy is, um, I, I think that's a real eye-opener. Um, we really do need to be cognizant of these, of these, um, these variations. Um, but, but again, I, I, think, I think as much as all of that is, is, is fantastic, I, I think we really, I think the data set itself is, is, is quite superb and, 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 I, and I, I do I do really think there, there's a there's a there's a a huge a huge step forward in understanding greenstones that we that we'll get out of this data as well. Um, I probably should stop there. I think I've probably been going for a bit too long. So that's it.